Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Stacy, and I'm a bookseller and the event coordinator at Belmont Books. Belmont Books, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is an independent and locally owned bookshop in Belmont, Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have one more virtual event coming up this year, which is Eleanor Lippman in conversation with Caroline Leavitt on December 29th, as well as a packed event calendar in January. You can register for these events on our website, which is belmontbooks.com, which is also where you can purchase Carol's book, Think Like a Feminist. If you have any concerns during the presentation, you can send a message to me in the chat section. And if you have questions for the authors, please type them into the Q&A section and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We're very excited to welcome Carol and Shelby. I wanna tell you a little bit about them and then I will turn the event over to them. Carol Hay is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at University of Massachusetts Lowell and author of the award-winning Kantianism, Liberalism, and Feminism, Resisting Oppression. She's written for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and A A E on magazine. Eon, yeah. Eon. Her academic work focuses primarily on issues in analytic feminism, liberal social and political philosophy, oppression studies, Kantian ethics, and the philosophy of sex and love. Carol grew up in Saskatchewan, Canada, and now divides her time between Boston and San Francisco with her daughter, Becca, and her cat, Dinah. Shelby Devlin is a San Francisco-based sex and intimacy coach. She's also a certified massage therapist and associate practitioner of orthobionomy, a bodywork modality used to release trauma through safety and comfort. Shelby is currently conducting original research on the emotional components of sexual desire as a graduate student in F SFSU's sexuality studies program. She's been working as a sex educator in San Francisco for the past decade. Not that she looks old enough to be able to have been doing it for that long, but that's what she says. And without further ado, I am going to turn the event over to them. Great, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us, Stacey. So Shelby, thank you for agreeing to do this. I'm super excited to talk about um, sex and the parts of my book that, um, you know, that where that's relevant because I've been talking about this the stuff in here with a lot of different people and um, sex just hasn't really come up very much surprisingly. So I'm really happy to have an expert to talk about this stuff. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. And it's Absolutely. funny, I talk about sex all day, every day, and now I'm really excited to talk about feminism, so. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, maybe before we get going, could you tell folks a little bit more about um, what you do, so you, you're just like the nature of your expertise, because I think that might sort of help structure or make sense of the conversation that we're gonna have. Absolutely. So as a sex and intimacy coach, what I focus on is helping people identify what is getting in the way of them having the sex and relationships that they want to have. So I work with both individuals and couples. Typically people come to me with a problem to solve. Either they have desires that they're having difficulty integrating into their relationships, having trouble getting into relationships, long-term relationships in which like the sex just doesn't click. So it's a broad spectrum of issues, but I tend to focus on um, unique problems. So I work with a lot of like peculiar fetishes and uh, complex desires. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I think your work is really cool and I think it's it'll be really nice to sort of get, get the perspective of someone who has thought a lot about these things um, in talking about how sex and feminism intersect. So. Uh, I wanted to start, if that's okay, by reading a couple of pages from the book that I think might sort of structure our discussion in interesting ways. Um, and Absolutely. I've chosen something that I talk about at the end of the book, and it's an it's it's a nice in to um, a lot of themes that I spend the book uh, spend a lot of time in the book building up to. Um, primarily, the idea of how our um, oppression can be internalized, right? So we could, if like if we're individual people living in an oppressive society, right, a society that's sexist, that's racist, that's transphobic, that's homophobic, that's ableist, that's all of these things, right? The thought is like that stuff um, doesn't just affect us externally by preventing us from being able to do what we might wanna do or that sort of thing. It can also actually affect us internally, right? We can take this stuff on board and it can sort of structure our values, our sense of self, our sense of what's possible for people like us, our sense of what's desirable for people like us. And so internalized oppression is a major theme running through the book. And um, 
obviously that's going to intersect with our set with, with our sense of what kind of sexual um, possibilities are open for people like us um, in ways that are infected with sexism. So that's that's sort of sort of to sort of a preamble to what I'm going to talk about here. Okay. That I'm sounds perfect. That. Okay. I get questions sure. about this every day in my practice. Yes, I'm sure you do. Okay. So um, here's the section I'm going to read. So. I say, um, but let's be honest, um, many of us don't really want men to entirely quit with the chivalry, do we? I like it when my boyfriend pays for dinner and spoils me with presents. I like it when he schleps my too heavy suitcase for me, even though we both know I'm capable of carrying it myself. And I like these things not just because they're romantic and sweet, I like them because they're gendered. We've both internalized these romantic scripts and we both find pleasure in playing our gendered roles. Along these same lines, I usually enjoy performing my femme identity. Makeup can be fun. Cute shoes are delightful. I won't pretend not to feel a brush of glee when I catch myself or a glimpse of myself in a mirror or a Zoom window, right? <laughs> and I'm feeling pretty that day, right? Um, I've gone through phases where my feminist indignation about the amount of time and money I was expected to sink into these pursuits made me stop indulging these narcissistic delights. Without fail, my self-esteem would tank. It didn't matter if every feminist bone in my body knew how much unnecessary energy I was wasting on this frippery. I hated myself without it. Eventually I'd decide it wasn't worth it to not feel like myself all the time and I'd return to the frivolities. I've been pretty good about not falling prey to the bad faith pretense that I want to look and dress like this for myself. Um, because come on, if we're honest with ourselves, dressing for ourselves looks like yoga pants and fuzzy sweaters, not stilettos and push-up bras. But that I let myself do this doesn't mean I don't often wish I didn't feel like I have to. What I've decided on over more than four decades as a feminist femme is a strategy perhaps best described as candid ambivalence. I try to admit that the person I wanna be, the person I am, is a person whose fundamental desires and sense of self have been messed up by the sexist norms and expectations of a patriarchal world order that I'm committed to dismantling that I am this way because I've taken on board a stunted and limiting story about what women are good for. And I understand that my conventional performances of cis white femininity harm other women. I wanna emphasize this because I think this is really important. I understand that my conventional performances of cis white femininity harm other women. Women who for reasons of racism or ableism or classism or transphobia, pay the price because they cannot or will not live up to the standards that I affirm by my behavior and thus reinforce in the culture at large. My strategy of ambivalence here has been inspired by one gestured at by Sandra Bartke. Analyzing the hypothetical case of a woman whose masochistic sexual fantasies are fundamentally at odds with her feminist political commitments, Bartke argues that such a woman is what she says, she, this is a quote, she says she's entitled to her shame. So it's not that this woman ought to feel shame exactly, certainly not in the finger wagging, you ought to be ashamed of yourself sense of the term, but neither is, um, is it that she ought not to feel shame. Here's a quote where he says, her desires are not worthy of her after all, nor is it clear that she's a mere helpless victim of patriarchal conditioning, unable to take any responsibility, about any, unable to take any responsibility at all for her wishes and fantasies. It makes sense for this woman to feel shame, Barkey thinks, because quote, shame is a wholly understandable response to behavior that is seriously at variance with principles, right? So when Barkey says this woman should feel ashamed, she's not trying to shame her. She's, she's saying, yeah, you're tracking. Shame is an appropriate emotion given the situation that you find yourself in. Right? So anytime people put on clothes, they're performing a usually gendered identity. But I think we need to try to be aware of how our appearance works toward or against a patriarchal culture. Only you can decide whether it's in conflict with your political principles and what to do if it is. Do what you can to make your performances of gender your own. Um, here's a quote from Audre Lorde. She says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crushed into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. Remember, as Uma Narayan puts it, that we're all bargaining with patriarchy. But at the end of the day, don't pretend that everything's fine when it's not. D uh, um, don't pretend that you're fine when you're not. When you do that, you minimize the harms of this misogynistic world order. Recognize that any insistence that, you that your performance of femininity is done for its own sake, that it's being turned in without any interest in, in whether it's attractive to men or anyone else, is likely not taking seriously the deep connections between femininity and objectification. Admit that you've been messed up, 
that your damaged goods, that some of your deepest, most identity conferring priorities and commitments have been warped by precisely those forces of sexism that you're committed to destroying. But you might decide this isn't the hill worth dying on. Maybe all the navel gazing on a therapist's couch it would take to excise this particular incarnation of patriarchy's grip on your soul isn't the best use of your feminist energies. Maybe you'd be better slapping on some lipstick and getting to the rape crisis hotline you volunteer at on time. Better to pick your battles and make the changes you can. Okay. So, what do you think, Shelby? <laughs> <laughs> so many things. I have so many questions, in fact. <laughs> I couldn't help also just like, you know, reflecting while you're reading that passage and sitting here with my red lipstick and my long hair and, you know, the attention and effort that I put into my appearance and the performance of my femininity feel called out a little bit, but also that's okay. Yeah. I mean, like the pot is, would be calling the kettle black here, right? I, 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 no, I think totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. So okay, is, we've, I, we've had nail painting parties. <laughs> we have exactly, exactly. Right. So I think that, um, yeah, so this is, this has been a puzzle that I've really sort of struggled with, I think for much of my adult life, right? Like this recognition that, um, um, I, I feel compelled to, and I feel pleasure in performing a femme identity that, um, isn't, isn't innocent, isn't neutral. Right. It's 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 not it's not something I came up with myself. Right. It's my interpretation of femininity, but um, it's something that exists in the culture at large. Um, if I don't perform it, I mean, I've gone through phases of not performing this identity, and I I just I felt awful. I I, I was depressed. Right. Um, I didn't feel like myself. Um, but then I do it, and then I feel guilty because um, it's not so much shame, but guilt because I, I but I do sort of feel like I am. Like, because I, I can, I can have done all the feminist work and sort of say, okay, but like when I'm, like when I'm performing femininity, I'm doing it, you know, like with an eye to all the feminist criticisms. But a person on the street doesn't see that; they just see a femme, and then, and yeah. they, or yeah, they just see like a, a, a conventional, you know, cis white, able-bodied woman. Um, and I haven't upset their world order or their, their 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 sense of what women should be like at all, right? And so, um, it's not enough to just, I think, just. Mm -hmm. say that okay I've, I've you know I've thought about this and I'm doing this for me because that like the, the, that, that uptake isn't going to be there you know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I mean I think ultimately the opinion of the person on the street doesn't matter when it comes to how we're performing or not performing and frankly like when we focus on what we should or should not do, that doesn't leave a lot of space for pleasure. And there is a lot of pleasure to be had in our performances, whichever we choose. And that's something that I choose to focus on and encourage people to focus on. What feels good? What feels right? Does it matter if there's some stigma around wearing high heels, if it feels good or it makes you feel good? I mean, mm -hmm. wearing high heels doesn't physically feel good all the time, but you know, sometimes you like feel good when you're wearing them. Yep. And I think that's what I hope feminists embrace more is what makes us feel good is very personal and it's choiceful. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm on board with that. I think except insofar as I, I don't want to pretend that what I choose to do has no effect on other people. Mm -hmm. right? Like that, like that, that, that's where my concern really comes in because when I perform mm -hmm conventional cis white femininity, um, mm -hmm. I am making the world harder. I am making the world worse for people who can't or, weren't, or won't perform this most valuable form of femininity, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think as feminists, it's not just about looking at, at, at the level of individual choice. I think we actually have to sort of look at how our, how our actions ramify in the culture at large. And that's where, that, that, that's where my concern comes in, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pickle. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I understand it's like in your role as a sex coach, right? Like obvious, like, like, like your job is to help people come to terms with this stuff for themselves. Right. Yeah. But I, yeah. But then I think, yeah, there, there is this sort of feminist tension with that, but again, and it's not the fault of individual people that they find themselves living in a world that is deeply, profoundly sexist and racist and transphobic and homophobic and all of these things, right? This is the world we're thrown into, right? Mm -hmm. It's us, it's up to us to figure out how to navigate that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I could talk about this all night, but I know you have other questions. So if I can ask you to I ask some more do. of those. Okay. Actually, it's kind of, it's on theme with what we've been discussing. Let me pull up my questions right now. 
Um, yeah, this is actually very relevant to what we we're discussing already. Okay. In your book, you discuss sexual objectification and the harm it causes women, especially after the rise of the Me Too movement. The objectification has become a dirty word in our culture. And this distresses me greatly because I meet so many people of many genders who deeply desire the experience of objectification. Being objectified turns them on. So what are your thoughts on how to objectify someone sexually or be objectified, but still remain a feminist? I love this question. Um, so I think, and, it, and, it's, and it's actually something that um, a number of other feminists have, have actually taken up explicitly, right? There's this, um, uh, so what, one of the feminists I talk about in my book is uh, Nancy Bauer, who's a, a fabulous um, feminist based at Tufts here in Boston, actually. Um, and um, she's got this article uh, article in N plus one magazine called Porn Utopia. And she talks about um, the, di and the difference between the real world and the porn world, right? And mm -hmm. so she talks about how um, the world, in the, in the rules of the real world being objectified is very often disrespectful, right? To sort of like when you objectify someone, you literally like you treat them like they're an object. And an object is precisely not a person, or right? a person is a is a being that has hopes and dreams and desires and you know opinions on the matter and like um, life plans and goals. And objects have none of those things. They're objects. They're they're things that exist to be used, right? Um, and so the thought is that um, it's on the face of it, it's pro it's morally problematic to treat a person as if they were an object because it's disrespectful, right? You're failing to um, give the appropriate kind of moral attention attention to the most important thing about a person, which is her ability to make her own life plans, to have, a, have like her own desires or her own her wishes, her own beliefs, right? So, so that's, that's, the, that's the sort of standard philosophical um, feminist account of what's problematic about objectification is that you're treating a person like they're an object, right? So that, and this is where we get these, these, these terms like, you know, like uh, uh, someone who's, who's been objectified says that, that they feel like a piece of meat, right? They feel like they're just being mm -hmm. used, right? Um, and you can see why this is incompatible with the normal kind of respect that we expect and demand of people in, you know, in the public sphere, right? It's it's a bad thing to treat to treat someone as a, as, as if they're an object usually, but then mm -hmm. then there's this there's this weirdness where sex comes in, right? Because it it it's like um, Bauer points out, and as you point out, I suspect many of your clients come to you with with with, with, um, with issues around objectification, right? Um, objectification being treated like an object is incredibly um, erotic erotic for many many people right um and so there's this question like is that by itself problematic or is it just that it's problematic in the sexist society that we live in and i think that people with particular sort of particular probably i would, I would call them conservative but that's maybe not the right word, word but like certain views about sex as being sort of inherently dirty um, those people might think that objectification is always morally problematic in a sexual context and that it's um, it, it's never okay. I'm not in that in that camp. I think that objectification is problematic in a sexual context when it is precisely because um, we live in a society where what happens in the bedroom and what happens in the public square um, in, interact in certain ways, right? So the thought is that if we lived in a perfectly egalitarian society where there was no sexism, no racism, none of this stuff, then what people chose to do in their private sexual lives um, wouldn't be negatively affected by the oppressed by, by, by a world that's problematic um, by, by a social world that's problematic right but that's not the world we live in right the world we live in is one that's deeply sexist deeply racist and the thought is that these um, prejudices these biases affect who we are as sexual beings right like we've like by the time we become an adult by the time we're a full, uh, you know a fully, fully fledged sexual being we've drunk a lot of kool-aid and that kool-aid is racist and sexist and problematic in all of these ways and so the thought is that um, um, what do you how do you navigate this as a feminist well first of all I think you have to make sure that um, the objectification happens in a particular context right so it has to happen in a context of mutual respect um, it has to happen in a context of, con of, of consent right of, con of open communication between sexual partners Right. So there's sort of like background stuff that happens, maybe like maybe if not outside the bedroom, like just inside the bedroom, right? That um, that guarantees that. So like, if, if you've got a relationship of, of equality or rough equality between the partners, then what those two equals decide they want to do in the bedroom is fine from a feminist point of view, right? But the, but the concern is that um, so many relationships are marked by inequalities outside mm -hmm. the bedroom, and of course we don't leave those things at the door when we start having sex, right? Right. So. Um, 
yeah, so the, <laughs> that was a long way of sort of saying, yes, of course you can objectify someone sexually and have it be completely fine, um, mm -hmm. but it should probably only be ha happening when you're having consensual sex. <laughs> and it shouldn't be happening, you know, when someone's just walking down the street, for example, or um, when someone hasn't consented to be objectified, right? Um, so yeah, so I think that there's there's maybe a stereotype of feminists being these sort of like prudes who hate sex. Um, and I don't think that's true, right? But I do think that feminists are very critical of the ways that these background social conditions can affect even very intimate personal relations relationships. Absolutely. There yeah. tends to be either like a right way or a wrong way to like have sex or be objectified, just like gender performance, performing femininity out in the world can impact, negatively impact other women. And the same goes for in the bedroom. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you wanna ask more questions? I could keep that, I mean, of course. <laughs> I, no, want, of I wanna course. make sure we get through all of this stuff. <laughs> <but I hope. laughs> Just so much to think about. Yeah. Okay, well, um, all right, here's something. In the chapter entitled Sexual Violence, you spend some time discussing the work of Catherine McKinnon, uh, specifically the relationship between sexual violence and mainstream pornography. Do you think someone can be a feminist and enjoy porn or even make porn? And can a man be a feminist and watch mainstream porn? Yeah. yeah. Um, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. Yeah. No, I, I'll, I have a follow up question. Ah, go, okay. Start with this. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think um, I think at least my feminist take on mainstream porn is that it is deeply problematic. It's problematic for um, uh, a couple of reasons. I think um, Catherine McKinnon is um, a, a feminist philosopher and legal scholar who gives a pretty good explanation, I think, for what is wrong with most mainstream uh, porn. And so. Um, in the book, I spent a lot, of, a lot of time talking about um, McKinnon's analysis of what's wrong with pornography. And McKinnon is actually in the camp of radical feminists in the 1980s who put together a surprisingly effective, and effective in, in the sense of like, they were able to get laws passed um, based on this argument, um, arguing that pornography was wrong because it actually harmed women. And so they claimed that there was a direct causal link between watching pornography and committing sexual violence against women. So they explained, this is why we live in a culture, a culture where one in six women experiences sexual violence. Um, and so they said the, the, like the cause of this, uh, of, of rape was pornography. And so they said, and so since porn was responsible for harming women, they argued that um, there was a legal justification for, um, for censoring it. Right, so the, so the thought is that it was a balance of the pornographers, people who make pornography, their right to free speech had to be balanced, balanced against women's right to actually live as free and equal citizens in society. And the thought is that because um, pornography contributes to a, a society where women um, uh, have a very statistically high risk of sexual violence, um, it was, it was uh, there, there was a there was a legal basis for prohibiting it, and it actually was successful. They they passed uh, local ordinances in several cities. Um, those ordinances were almost immediately overturned by other mayors or higher up the chain. Um, although McKinnon's analysis actually was influential in crafting Canada's um, uh, uh, anti obscenity law in certain ways. Um, so it's not often um, that you get, uh, uh, especially not in the 80s, I think it wasn't very often that you that, that, that you saw feminists actually getting this kind of uptake in legal circles. And so McKinnon was incredibly influential. She worked a lot with another feminist named Andrea Dworkin. Incredibly influential and incredibly controversial, right? Because um, almost immediately um, while she was doing this work, arguing that pornography directly harms women, um, she uh, was, um, uh, so, I mean, she showed herself willing to sort of make political hay with um, a lot of conservatives who were anti-porn, not for reasons, not for feminist reasons, but for sort of standard, you know, mm -hmm. prudish reasons, basically. Um, conservative. Conservative reasons, yeah, exactly. Regressive, my mom might want to say, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and so um, McKinnon found herself at odds with another group of feminists um, who called themselves sex positive feminists. And the sex that positive feminist said that McKinnon was sort of like had this kind of neo-Victorian view uh, that was really quite prudish that she was characterizing sex as something that men wanted and women just put up with, right? Um, 
And so they argued that no, it was possible to uh, make porn that was feminist friendly or, or explicitly feminist, right? And actually a lot of these er um, early sex positive feminists were themselves very critical of the misogyny in mainstream porn. And so they were the ones arguing for more variety in porn, for porn made by women, for porn made that was explicitly feminist, right? Um, so this is the debate that feminists have had, and I think um, it's one that we can probably say has been pretty, pretty decisively won by the sex positive feminists, if only because the possibility of actually censoring porn, like maybe that was an option when McKinnon was writing this stuff in the 80s, when people's access to porn was like magazines and like blue movie theaters and like early VCR cassettes, right? Like this was the big, apparently this is actually why, why VCRs took off as a technology because it was porn that people would realize they could watch porn in the privacy of their that own. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, and obviously now the technology has improved and now we have the internet. And so like, even if it was an option to censor porn um, legally, um, it's no longer practically an option, right? Given the existence of the internet. Um, and so I think, so basically um, the feminist consensus is that McKinnon's Legal argument doesn't work, right? It's been struck down by every um, by by every U.S. court, mm -hmm. um, and um, there's also a lot of concern about her causal argument, right? It's probably too simplistic to say that like dudes watch porn and are immediately inspired to go out uh, go out and rape women. Like that's just that's that's a little bit too short of a causal chain to be at all plausible, right? To, to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it mildly, right? Um, but you might think that, that McKinnon's onto something with her moral analysis of what goes on in conventional porn, right? And so, so McKinnon has, has that sort of ask, like, like pay attention to what's actually going on in standard porn. And again, for all the variety in porn, right? There's rule for a 34 of the internet, right? If it, if it exists, there's porn of it, right? Um, so it's true that there's a lot of variety in porn, but at the same time, we shouldn't pretend that so much of it is just depressingly the same, right? There's a very, very narrow script for what bodies are supposed to look like. And what we have is actually a, a big, dis, um, dimorphism right you have very big older men who are having sex with smaller um younger women right that's 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 kind of like that that's the conventional porn script right so already there's a power imbalance right the, these actors are playing people who are not equal in society right and that it, the, and that power imbalance is itself eroticized and mckinnon goes on and she says basically what we what we see in porn is the eroticization of gendered roles of dominance and submission which is basically just a fancy way of saying men fuck and women get fucked, right? And that's 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 what it is to be a woman is to be someone who gets fucked, and what it is to be a man is to be someone who fucks, right? And so we have these, and and McKinnon actually goes further to say this is actually this is what this is what constructs gender itself, um, our understanding of sexuality as being very very gendered and having this this hierarchical relationship of dominance and submission. This is what makes men and women who they are in our culture. And she says this is deeply problematic because there's this built-in power asymmetry, right? Again, if this was just all happening in a vacuum and everyone just happened to have their own particular kinks, that'd be great, right? But we're talking about large social trends here, right? Um, and given and, and, and from this this perspective of, of this sort of overarching analysis of of, uh, porn, of porn's effect on our sexualities, um, McKinnon said, argues, and I think argues pretty convincingly that we, there's, huge, there's, 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 a, there's, there's a lot of cause for feminist concern here, right? Mm -hmm. um, why is it that we as a culture, like speaking in broad terms, why is it that we as a culture get off on men dominating women, men controlling women, men subjugating women, men abusing women? Right? You know, think about you know, like the, <laughs> the what, like what people are called in porn, right? Women are called sluts, whores. Like maybe like maybe baby girls or whatever it is, right? Um, cunts, right? Men are called you know daddy, stud, right? Like these roles, like like honorifics, if anything, right? Um, so like 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 why is why is insulting a woman something that's eroticized in so much conventional pornography, right? right? Um, these are the questions that that feminists in, in McKinnon's wake really want us to focus on, right? So less on the idea that this is obviously there's some sort of direct causal uh, link between watching this stuff and being inspired to rape a woman, but more just really having us like stop and ask what is going on that so many of us find this erotic. Um, so yeah, so I think as a feminist, you can watch this stuff, um, but um, and, and maybe inspired by Barky, you, you can think maybe it's not the best use of your feminist energies to um, not let yourself indulge in this stuff if this is really the only the only avenue for sexual satisfaction for you. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, maybe do it. But I would say don't pretend that everything's fine when it's not, right? Again, the strategy of Canada ambivalence, like admitting that the water that you're swimming in is murky as hell, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and then like trying to like, and then do, and then do the best you can. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I hope.
<laughs> what was your follow up? I, I know I, I went off. <laughs> no, so it's great. Um, so there is this phenomenon that's been happening with young men, um, basically due to their unfettered access to pornography, is that they're learning about their body's response and their desire through pornography and they're kind of programming their body and their brain to only respond to pornography so when they actually have a partner in front of them they become impotent and this is a growing phenomenon in the united states which is somewhat ironic given the concerns that McKinnon has about men wanting to rape women or harming women more. Yeah. The fact is with unfettered access to porn, their bodies stop working. Yeah. I, um, I'm familiar with some, I, I, I think you're probably, you know a lot more detail about this stuff than I do, but I am familiar with some of this research and it is fascinating, right? So apparently like the, the, the stuff I've read describes um, basically, you know, men will, will seek treatment for impotence. Um, mm -hmm. And once they've sort of ruled out various physical causes um, they, and they, you know, they, they, they draw a link to porn consumption. Apparently um, if it's an older man, like a man in his like forties, fifties, sixties, um, it's relatively treatable. Like, and, and the, um, the, um, like the, the prescription is usually just like stop watching porn, go cold turkey, mm -hmm. give it a bit, and you will relearn how to like like have a sexual response to an actual live human being, right? Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to like all of like the the immediate gratification of porn, right? Um, apparently, when younger men present with the same problem, it's far harder to treat because the thought yeah. is like their very sexualities have been formed in response to this, right? Like an older man presumably has had other stimuli to sort of form his sexuality, whether it's his own imagination or even just, you know, like magazines. The Sears catalog. Like, the Sears catalog, <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Um, but yeah, but younger men, um, it's like the, 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 the impetus is much harder to treat because their very sexuality has been um, has been constructed in this way. And I think it's it's tragic. I think it's, it's, it's completely tragic. And again, this isn't like, this isn't a sort of a, you know, thing, a prudish like concern a conservative like rejection of porn as being prurient or you know like you mm -hmm. know inciting lust or like encouraging premarital sex like no i think i think sex is great i think porn but but i do i, I do worry about like people like my students age for example right when like their, their very sexuality is formed in relation to these incredibly unrealistic images of human bodies and completely unrealistic expectations about what sex is supposed to be like, right? Like I'm always yelling at my students, like porn is not an instruction manual. If you think porn is an instruction manual, you are gonna have really bad sex, right? Well, that <laughs> brings up a bigger issue of media literacy and yeah. most people just aren't getting any lessons in media literacy. So they believe porn is instructional rather than entertainment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, yeah, and that's just it. So I think if you understand porn as a fantasy um, and treat it as such, right, it's fantasy world, it's, it's, it's it, as Nancy Barra calls it, she says it's a utopia, right? Um, where the rules of the real world are flipped on its head, right? Mm -hmm. So in the real world, respecting someone involves like treating them with respect and asking them what they want and respecting their desires and you know doing things consensually because those, those are the rules in the real world but Bauer yeah. says in the porn world those rules are like flipped on their head mm -hmm. and so precisely what it is to respect someone is to just use them to treat them like an object that's what respect looks like in this utopian world right and we're familiar mm -hmm. with the phenomena of like of a fictional world having rules that aren't the same as our actual world right mm -hmm. so for example if we um if I were to sort of tell you that um Batman was flying. If you were someone who was up in the Marvel universe, you would know that Batman actually can't fly. Superman can fly, but Batman can't mm -hmm. fly. So it breaks the rules of that fictional universe to say that Batman is flying. Batman needs his technology in order to fly. He can't fly by himself, right? Um, and so, and again, it, it doesn't matter that in the real world, nobody can fly, <laughs> right? To um, the thought is that in this fictional world, um, there are rules and those rules are contained and bound within that fictional world and you can't break them. And so Bauer's point is kind of like this, right? So the rules of the porn world are completely different than the rules of the real world. And then the problem is of course, when people either forget or don't realize that, the, that this is a pretend world, it's a fake world, that those rules don't and shouldn't apply in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that does go some way to um, uh, both explaining what goes wrong when people like, become um 
when people's sex lives actually end up becoming negatively impacted by porn. Um, and it does actually it, it clear some room for a feminist friendly watching of porn where people are treating each other in ways that were those ways happening in the real world that would be problematic. I'm still inclined and I've actually pushed Nancy on this in various places um, to ask the further question, okay, but why? Why is it that these scripts are the ones that turn so many of us on? Right? Mm -hmm. Because it like, like, because like the conventional script isn't one where a woman is abusing a man or you know like dominating a man that thing exists right because of course there's porn of everything right but that's mm -hmm. not the conventional script right so i still want us to sort of spend some time asking ourselves like looking in the mirror asking ourselves why is it that this is what turns us on um yeah i i think that is completely valid and that has been an important question and tastes have changed so the number one porn searches right now are incest porn, particularly around stepmom and stepson. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, so is that to do with like the pandemic with everyone stuck at home or something? Or oh no, this has been true for several <laughs> okay. years. I have okay, a okay. I have an article in a book you could read. But nice, nice. Yeah, basically the the number one porn searches aren't you know like rape porn or like violent porn against like women. barely legal yeah, yeah i mean that, that that stuff is still being made in like ridiculous amounts but it is not what is what people are searching for right now and i think that is really interesting people are leaning in towards the taboo in the past several years mm -hmm. rather than the simulated violence yeah i mean i guess that's a, it, and it is interesting to sort of ask why it is that the taboo is has such a draw and i suspect that i mean i think that that predates the existence of porn or at least the, the ubiquity it's, of porn the, that we have now well violence against women is no longer taboo it's yeah. normal so you got to find something else yeah oh god <laughs> <laughs> you know okay just to brighten your 2020 a little bit yeah yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Um, actually, so this might be redundant given everything that you just shared with us, but many people struggle to appreciate the difference between fantasy and reality when it comes to pornography, while most people struggle with the difference between fantasy and desire. Um, fantasy being something that feels good to think about and desire is something we actually want to do. So my question is, is there a place for darker fantasies and desire in feminism? Yeah, I think there is. And I think actually, um, I think you actually see it in a lot of um, BDSM and kink communities, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of these communities are either implicitly and sometimes often even explicitly feminist. And I think that's probably not a coincidence, right? Because these are communities that have very good reason to have very well established norms of consent and sexual communication and things like this, right? Obviously, because they're, they're engaging in practices that without these well-established norms would be immoral and they know it, right? So they're they're really good about communicating about this stuff, right? Um, people in these communities, right? And um, so I think that the, 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 you know, the people who are doing this, you know, like if it's a lifestyle or, or even just like within these well-entrenched communities, like they know what they're doing, right? I think it's, it's, this, it's, I think it's probably people who aren't in those communities who are just having regular, maybe not necessarily vanilla, but like sex without, um, without existing in these communities where, where you have these well-established norms of communication. I think that's where it, where it tends to get a lot more problematic, right? Because I think we have this weird idea that we're not supposed to talk about sex, even when we're doing it. Right, oh, and yeah. it's just that, yeah, <laughs> and that's bizarre to me, right? But it's but it, like the thought is like this is just unsexy, right? It's, I mean, it, meanwhile, feminists are over here saying no, no, like we need to like 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 we started off in the '90s with the idea of like no means no, right? There's like we call this negative consent, right? Um, and then from there we moved on to the idea of affirmative consent. But affirmative consent actually sort of came into existence right around the same time that negative consent um, consent started getting talked about. Again, this was in the '90s. Um, it was at Antioch College. Um, and they were so they, they came up with um, with this sort of code of conduct on on campus, right? It's, 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 a, it's a liberal arts college, right? All the kids are living in dorms, and they came up with a code of comment conduct that required explicit verbal consent for every stage in a, in a sexual encounter, 
right? So for anything, if you were going to have sex on campus you, and you had to sign this code in order to like live in the dorms, right? You, you, you would agree that if you were going to have sex, you would you would verbally request every new stage of the sexual encounter, um, and there had to be verbal re re request and verbal consent. Um, and this was just like it was pilloried. Like people just make fun of it. Like there was a Saturday Night Live skit, right, where like Mike Miller is like just like portraying this like the world's most awkward undergrad, and be like, "May I elevate the level of intimacy by touching your buttocks?" And just like people made fun of it. They thought it was absurd. Right? It was absurd mm -hmm. that it could be sexy to talk about sex, right? And um, for years, people made fun of it. But it's funny. I think now, like looking back in the like in the in the age of me too i think in some ways like that 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 approach to sex looks really sort of ahead of its time right because mm -hmm. people there really sort of said that like the community norms were that you had thought about your sexual preferences that you were able to communicate them um and that involved and that 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 turned into a community where people really were um where the norms were such that you like you you'd thought about you want what you wanted you were willing to ask for what you wanted and you were willing to take ownership of what you wanted right um and so it was, it was actually a very sex positive community, right? Whereas the um, the world at large saw this and thought it was just a bunch of like unrealistic, um, immature, naive students who were trying to like, who had read too much feminist theory and were trying to like take all of the sort of like all the fun, sexy ambiguity out of sex and make it really sterile and boring. Right? And I think we have this idea that if we talk about sex, it's not sexy, right? There's something, and even while we're doing it. And I think part of me suspects that's just because there's a, like, there's a lot of sort of in, ingrained shame and that people don't want it. People think sex is dirty. Um, this is often very gendered, right? Women especially are, are, are ingrained to not think it's okay to be sexual, um, right? Because a woman who is sexual or too sexual is, is, is derided as a slut, right? Um, it was only relatively recently that we even came up with a, with a term for a man who's sort of not appropriately in control of his sexual desires, right? So we call women sluts all the times. Um, for the longest time, we just called men male sluts, right? Because it was like, there's like, Men are supposed to want to have sex on, on the brain all the time, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, but now finally we have the word fuck boy, which is that <laughs> it was my students who told me about this at one point. I'm like, oh yeah, there is a word because I would be up at the front of the classroom. Like, we don't even have a word for a male slut. They're like, yeah, we do. It's fuck boy. I'm like, yes. All right. So at least now we have like egalitarianism and insults, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we are making progress, I think, in some ways. But there's still, I think, there's a lot of sort of ingrained ideas that we shouldn't be talking about sex even when we do it and this this is the kind of thing that feminists are really kind of pushing against right that um uh if we if we think about um we need to sort so, of even move yeah go ahead yeah i'm sorry we only have a couple more minutes before we open it up to okay. questions so i want to ask one more very important question before we close like the interview okay if that's okay yeah so how can thinking like a feminist help people have better sex oh Nice. <laughs> I think this. Yeah, I think this is this is where I was going anyway. So, yeah. Great. I mean, I think. <laughs> so I think um, thinking like a feminist will. If you think like a feminist, then you will have um, thought about you will have thought about and you will care about um, what your partner actually wants. Um, and again, this doesn't that doesn't have to be like a long term, you know, like like committed monogamous relationship. It can be a one night stand, right? But there's still an idea that um, that you are having sex with someone who is an equal, someone who is um, deserving of your respect. And so you're, so you're, you're, you're gonna be more open, you're gonna be more empathetic, you're gonna be hopefully more honest about what it is that you want. Um, you will have hopefully um, sort of interrogated your own desires and um, worked through as much of the sort of inherent shame that you have about those. And so you're gonna be like coming to the table ready and, and able to have um, just sex that's more fun, more honest, more open, more adventurous. Um, then if you are stuck in a worldview where sex is shameful and not, to, and so like, cause I think like there's this sense that like, I think people are sometimes not willing to admit that they want to do something even while they're actually doing it. Right? And so mm -hmm. I think like, if, if you're thinking like a feminist, you'll have sort of worked through that and, and come to terms with what it is that you actually want and, and able to sort of interact with your partner sort of empathetically and with respect. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking like a feminist, you're gonna be uh, aware of power differences um, mm -hmm. and done what you can to minimize them, um, or at least make sure that the person, the, the partner with more power in, in, in the encounter isn't abusing that of power in, in ways that are that, that, that are problematic, right? So you're sort of attentive to vulnerabilities and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, power is acknowledged. That, yeah, power is acknowledged um, by, by all parties, right? And, and isn't exploited, mm -hmm. isn't abused, yeah. Um, one of the examples I give in the book is um, of, comes from a philosopher named Bonnie Mann, 
who says that um, her, her, her ideal of, of feminist friendly flirtation comes from the old movie Thelma and Louise, right? Which is, I highly recommend everyone watch if you haven't seen it, it's a classic for a reason. Um, but one of the things that's a classic, or the, one of the reasons that it's a classic is that it was actually the breakout role of, Broad, of Brad Pitt. It was his first movie. Um, and he um, he plays this steamy, uh, again, like he's got this very sort of very conventional de de depiction of masculinity. He's this bad boy, he's a bank robber, right? Um, and Gina Davis plays, I don't want to spoil too much of the plot because you all are going to go off and watch it <laughs> after this. <laughs> but but I, but I can say that there that there's this there's interaction between the two of them and Brad Pitt is just very, very cognizant of the power imbalance between between them and he doesn't he doesn't exploit it. He doesn't abuse it. Right. So he's he's patient. He's hesitant. He's open to the possibility that Gina Davis might say, no, she doesn't want to have sex with him. Of course, they end up having incredibly steamy sex. And it's great. Right? Um, but throughout the encounter, there really is there's this kind of like hesitation and reply and just like like giving her the space to decide what she wants and recognizing when she's not sure what she wants. OK, well, then you wait until she until she knows what she wants. Right. So the entire thing is shot through with respect. Right. Even though it's, it's steamy as hell it's Brad Pitt with his shirt off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's not my particular cup of tea. But, um, <laughs> So yeah, that's the kind of thing that I think if you're if you're thinking like a feminist, it will result in um, in better sex because I think um, if all partners in an encounter are being respected, um, that can't but lead to a better time, you know. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. It looks like we have a question. I'm going to read oh, it good. for you. Oh, good. While it's important to be able to verbalize, explicitly ask for certain sexual acts, surprise is also a key element of eroticism. Any suggestions on balancing spontaneity and consent? Oh, great question. Yes. Um, safe words. Safe words, right? <laughs> so um, I talk, again, I talk quite a bit about safe words in the book. Um, Safe words ar arose in the BDSM and kink communities, right? Where, um, so the thought is that you um, you take a word that is not likely to come up in the sexual encounter, right? So it can be something just like weird, like kimchi, or right? Or something that's completely unambiguous, like safe word. I love this, right? Your safe word is safe word, right? <laughs> or yeah, some people have like a coded system, right? So it's like green, yellow, red, right? And, you, and when, those, when these words are uttered, the partner, um, responds in a pre-agreed pre upon way. So like if, if the safe word is uttered, playtime's over or modified in a pre-existing way, right? And so this gives room for you know, spontaneity for trying things, um, but also just um, gives a partner a way to, the other partner a way to just immediately say, nope, not gonna do this, like we're done. And like you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to apologize for a safe word. You certainly would never apologize for, for using a safe word. You don't have to explain. Um, it's just, that's it, it's over, right? And so safe words give it, um, they, they're, really, they're, they're like a safety, they're, they're a safety harness or something, right? The thought is that you can really explore um, like very outre stuff, right? Um, but it's done in a way where like, um, you know, you might, you might be exploring a fantasy where, you know, you're, you're saying no all the time. And so suddenly no doesn't mean no anymore because you're exploring this, this, this fantasy, but the, you need an out, right? And that's, that, that's, where, that's where the safe word comes in, right? Um, and again, so the thought is, and like, so, so like spontaneity, um, experimentation, Again, again, you have to pay. You have to pay attention to the background conditions of the encounter, right? So, if this is just a one night stand with a with a relative stranger, what's going to be acceptable stuff to try is going to be a lot different than if it's an encounter with someone that you know and trust, right? Um, because the thought is like you just you just try something on a stranger having no idea like what you know whether they're going to like it. That's I mean, obviously you, you could see where there's a lot more room for things to go very very afoul. Right. So yeah, so safe words, I think, are really important. Um, Quill Kukla, who's a great feminist uh, philosopher, talks a lot about the importance of safe words in sexual communication. Um, they also talk about, um, they say that we actually need to move beyond even the ideal of consent um, in the um, in thinking about sexual communication, because they, they say that when you think about it, like most sexual communication like it's 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 not really right to sort of say like what's going on is like someone is cons someone is consenting right because that there's a, that that gives the idea that like people don't want something unless it's consented to right or it's just so so Quill says a better way to think about sexual m many forms of sexual communication is actually more akin to like an invitation right so if someone says I was wondering if you'd like to come up to come up to my hotel room with me right like. They're not, this isn't a request that you consent, consent to or refuse, right? This is an invitation, right? And the norms of invitation, Kukla points out, are really, really different than the norms of consent, right? Like invitation, like the invitations, 
have like like the, 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 the like and again, so think about this not inside the bedroom, just like if I invite you over for dinner or something like that, right? Then mm -hmm. they, they have norms of hospitality that they're governed by, right? They they're, they're sensitive to power dynamics, right? And like even just things like invitations are weird because like they generate um uh, a responsibility to thank uh, to thank the other person both in the inviter and the invitee, right? They're, like so they're 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 a really interesting kind of speech act, right? Um, mm -hmm. and so Kukla says you can that we also actually, range check. Yeah, exactly. You could rain check, right? Yeah, right. There, and and so it's um. So they say that we again, obviously, consent is really important, but it's the consent isn't the only morally relevant kind of communication that's going on in a sexual encounter, right? There, there there's other stuff that's happening as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Looks like we have another question. Oh, um, how can men reconcile the fact that the most acceptable, if not the only, sexual orientation is heterosexuality? And their value goes up the more sexually aggressive they are, while at the same time, deintegrating, demeaning the very same woman they're attracted to and wanting women have no power over them. Hmm. I mean, I'm going to read this again. How can men reconcile the fact that the most acceptable, if not the only, sexual orientation is heterosexuality? Well, first of all, you got to just get over that because, you know, obviously being queer is far superior than being straight, but <laughs> I'm being flipped, but not really. Um, but it is true, definitely, that we are, that we live in a world where um, that is that is vastly homophobic. So any kind of um, any kind of homosexual desire, whether it's latent or explicit, um, might be experienced as problematic by a man. But I, have, I, sh I should I should recognize that. Um, and then the second part of this question, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, their value goes up the more sexually aggressive they are, while at the same time denigrating the women they're attracted to. So yeah, I mean, I think what I'm what I'm hearing in this question is in some ways, the idea that um, men are, um, have often internalized the norms of the porn utopia, as, as Bauer would put it, right? That we have these certain scripts that men are supposed to um, uh, play, play their role in, right? Their gendered role in, their, the, the gendered role of dominance. And they're supposed to expect a woman to submit. Um, mm -hmm. And how do we, um, how do we respond to this? Well, I think we have to um, try to unlearn it, right? Or at least try to be aware of it. Um, and um, not just assume that this is going to be the sexual dynamic in every heterosexual encounter, right? Um, and again, so this is one of these things where it's, um, you start to realize that like really good sex often happens between people who know each other because you can't really na like navigate this stuff and negotiate this stuff without having conversations about it. Right, mm -hmm. and so um, the, the the sex that might run afoul of this stuff might be the kind of like drunken one night stands where people are just kind of like going along with the social scripts that are available to them, and if that happens, then things are very likely, if not 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 guaranteed, but you can see why so many sexual encounters are so unfulfilling at best, and obviously traumatic as at worst. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm here. Can you can you read anything else into that question? I, I wasn't quite sure whether I was actually at answering what what they'd asked. What do you think? Um, yeah, I I think that you did a good job of answering the question. It just it okay. seems more to me it's like men get trapped in this kind of vortex of performing masculinity, and often mm -hmm. they're doing things and following like socially acceptable desires rather than like seeking out their own desire and preferences yeah. and women also will are complicit in this performance seeing porn or like seeing films and thinking like men are supposed to behave a certain way when they're attracted to a woman and if my male partner isn't behaving in this way then that means something's wrong with him or i'm not desirable and that yeah. can create a really problematic tension in heterosexual relationships in which like a woman is encouraging a man to perform problematic masculinity because she believes that's the right thing for him to do. Mm -hmm. There's pressure yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Something else I think has been kind of implicit in a lot of the stuff we've been talking about tonight is that um, I think that queer sex and queer porn represents a way out of a lot of this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously like queer sex and queer porn still can, can still be infected by a lot of these problematic biases and things like that. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, um, as in like the BDSM or kink communities, right? Um, people like people who are having what, what, what's possible sometimes called non-normative sex, right? Sex other than just sort of straight vanilla heterosex. Um, 
they've they've had a chance to sort of think about this stuff maybe a little more often and mm -hmm. they're maybe a little a little more reflective about it and that's all totally good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any other questions out there? It doesn't look like it right now. Um, well, do you have any more questions for me? <laughs> no, I, I feel like I have so many things to think about. I really, truly enjoyed your book, especially bringing all of the different threads of feminism together so that they could be contrasted and compared. I felt like I learned a lot more about the different, um, just like the different facets of feminism that have been evolving over the years and kind of having a better understanding of where I fit in to feminism since I often feel like left out or pushed out as you know a cis like straight passing femme who you know kind of upholds these beauty these impossible beauty standards like I buy into that and um yeah, it just was refreshing. Thank you. Yeah, because I know, I mean, I think yeah, I, I fit in those boxes as well. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. sort of encouraging to hear that, yeah, my thinking through this stuff is useful for other people who are also thinking through it. It is very much so. Cool. Anybody have any other questions? No. Well, Carol, oh, wait, I, I think I see one. I'm sorry. I think it might be in, yeah. I think it might be in the chat, however. Oh, oh, yeah. Let's see. Wondering about this idea that if we focus on what right or wrong too much, then there is less room for desire um, versus an idea that it's hard to even get at to a question of desire when there's big power imbalance. <sighs> I think I guess I'm, I'm someone who doesn't think that desire needs to be at odds with morality. Um, so um, <laughs> I think that um, I think that ideally, good sex is morally robust, morally permissible sex, right? And there's and I think that um, the idea that um, good, desirable, you know, hot, you know, racy sex is even nasty sex, whatever it is, right, is is going to be sort of inherently morally problematic, right? So that like I think that itself reflects the taboos that we have in society where we think sex is dirty. There's something wrong with sex, right? So the, the thought is that you, you can't even you know, get into sexual desire unless you're doing something wrong. Um, and that's actually just what I want to reject. I mean, I think like my, my conception of human nature is one where like sex is a basic human good, like right up with there with like food and water and shelter, right? <laughs> and so, um, it can't be, you know, it can't be like, I, I, I just, I can't wrap my head around or I'm not willing to go to a moral view where we think like, this is just a kind of necessary evil that we have to put up with for, you know, for the creation of the species. And so we have to do what we can to kind of like minimize its harms by making sure it only happens within the context of marriage. Like philosophers have said these, and others have said these sorts of things. Like that's just, that's just not my view, right? My view is that this is just fundamentally the kinds of creatures we are. And so a morality for creatures like us needs to make room for a kind of sex, like for, for, for an understanding of sex and sexual desire that is um, fundamentally good, right? And, and morally acceptable. I think it's possible. I think it's, not, it's no coincidence that historically we haven't gone there, um, but I see no reason to actually go there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Carol and Chilvi. That was definitely a thought provoking conversation. I think we will all go home and think about that. <laughs> and so we really appreciate your time. And I also really appreciate everybody who came and joined in and asked some great questions. And I hope everybody stays safe and has happy holidays. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.